Good evening. Welcome. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Roosevelt House. I'm going to be on for just a minute because I'm going to hand over the introductory duties after a few words. We are so honored to have Nigel Hamilton here, who has written about so many important events in American history, as well as global history. The only notable event that he hasn't written about, I think, was the Battle of New Orleans, and he had his own Battle of New Orleans today. We are happy that there are more than one flight from New Orleans, but he's made it. Otherwise, we, Dean Polsky and I were going to do a tap dance. Um, so we are here, and we are here um, to celebrate the publication yesterday of his latest volume on FDR. Uh, and the end of World War II. And uh, we are in the most appropriate place to mark that publication in Roosevelt's own house. Mr. Hamilton told me upstairs that the book starts in November 1943. That couldn't be a better opening for me to point out that in November 1943, when Roosevelt was on a naval ship, this house was officially transferred to Hunter College with Eleanor Roosevelt ably filling in uh, for the president at the dedicatory ceremony. So we've just had, most of you know, our 75th anniversary. So welcome all. Um, special welcome to our wonderful board of advisor member and Ro all things Roosevelt champion, Bill Vanden Heuvel. Ambassador Vanden Heuvel is here. And, uh, my friend Stephen Schlesinger is here, whose uh, connections to the Roosevelt story are familial and deep. <laughs> so Steve, welcome. So I also want to um, recognize a, a special guest who is here today, um, a Hunter College alum of good standing and high standing who is going to be joining a number of distinguished alums and uh, professors and others uh, for a book to celebrate the upcoming 150th anniversary of Hunter College, Arlene Alda. <laughs> and our husband is here today, too. Some of you may think he's only interested in the Korean War for obvious reasons, but clearly he's also interested in World War II, so it's a great honor to have the great Alan Alda here as well. So we're bringing out the heavy guns for the introduction. Please welcome the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Hunter, Andy Polsky. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here this evening to share in this event. Um, uh, if I can, at the beginning, just offer, ask you, remind you to please turn off or silence your cell phones, um, because when they beep during the program, a ring, it's, it's a distraction. <clears throat> I'm delighted to welcome back Nigel Hamilton to Hunter College. Um, Nigel Hamilton is a noted historian and biographer. I had the pleasure of interviewing Nigel here at Roosevelt House when he published the first volume in his trilogy on FDR's wartime leadership, The Mantle of Command. Tonight he'll be talking about the final volume, which covers the latter part of the war, um, I'm an unabashed fan of his work, in part because it gives abundant support to the argument I made in my book that Roosevelt was a far better wartime leader than Winston Churchill. Um, <clears throat> although I've also said Winston Churchill wrote the first great novel to come out of the war, his six-volume history. <laughs> um, let me briefly set the stage by suggesting the key tasks that a wartime president must accomplish as a war approaches its conclusion. By that point in a war, he will have made crucial decisions about whether to go to war, mobilizing the resources needed to fight the war, and identifying the primary goals that the country will seek in the conflict. In various ways, he will have tied his hands because the costs, political, financial and military, of changing direction would be enormous. One decision leads almost inevitably to another, 
Um, and only to a certain extent can a president deflect that course of action. But a great deal remains to be done. The president must manage alliances with other countries, each of which will have its own agenda, which may be at odds with that of the United States. The president has to sustain domestic support for the war effort as the costs and casualties increase. And above all, the president has to put in place the plans for peace. This last task is especially important. And the one task that, that I have examined, it's the one task that presidents have performed worse, that is, less successfully than any other. They often fail to appreciate that they will have little or no time after the war to engage in peace building. By the time the war ends, allies don't need each other anymore. And the people back home are exhausted and eager to put the war and foreign entanglements behind them. FDR knew this because he had witnessed what happened after World War I when Woodrow Wilson tried his famous effort to bring the United Nations into the League of Nations. So he, perhaps more than other presidents, was acutely conscious of how little time remained for him to do what he needed to do in the effort to build peace. With these very few observations um, of my own, not Nigel Hamilton's, I'm delighted to turn over the podium to our guest. Please join me in welcoming Nigel Hamilton back to Roosevelt House. Thanks very much, Andy, and can you all hear me? Um, yeah, I missed my flight. <laughs> Uh, New Orleans airport was mobbed and by returning jazz festers. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't get through security. But I managed to get the last seat on the following plane. But I'm delighted to be here. And I feel as if um, I'm among friends. <laughs> although you're at liberty to take issue with anything I say. But um, I was taken to dinner last night. I, I gave a presentation to, at the uh, National World War II Museum, which some of you may have visited, probably the finest war museum in this country. And um, uh, some uh, a fellow guest uh, unwisely showed me the, the uh, tie, and I said, oh, that would be great tomorrow night. <laughs> These people are really committed. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm really uh, very, very uh, honored to have been invited to talk to you. And um, particularly because uh, today is not only the um, anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe, VE Day, May the 8th, but it's also the 70, with, it's coming up to the 75th anniversary of D-Day itself, and um, I have a very special personal connection with it. My father landed as a 25-year-old battalion commander at D-Day and uh, lost 600 men in, out of 1,000 in his battalion during that battle. And uh, in the years afterwards, when we, my brothers and I were small children, he would take us to Normandy in Brittany and, camping just in farmer's fields. And I think looking back, it was his way of saying something to those men who didn't get through. So anyway, I have a very special connection. But it's also a connection that makes me feel very deeply that D-Day has not always been understood in this country in terms of the crisis that took place at the very highest level of decision-making among the Allies in November and December of 1943. And so I've called my talk, The Man Who Saved D-Day. Um, I'm going to start, if I can operate this. We have slides. Who do, what do I, I, there we go. So, um, the, just to remind you, the first volume covered 
uh, each volume begins with a voyage. And the first volume began with FDR's voyage to uh, Newfoundland to meet Winston Churchill, really, for the first time, on their battleships, and to set down a sort of moral basis for fighting war if the United States was attacked, the Atlantic Charter. R Churchill was very reluctant, but he did sign up to it. And the men, the two men, the two leaders, became great friends from that moment onwards. Uh, the other thing that uh, FDR did in the period covered by the mantle of command was to overrule his military staffs. And I want to emphasize that you probably know more <laughs> about FDR than in various respects than I will ever know, coming from beyond the other side of the pond. Uh, but uh, I have spent 10 years studying FDR, not simply as a leader, but specifically as commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the United States. And the reason I decided to write the book, because it was only going to be one, was that I had been writing a book about 12 presidents, American Caesars, and it had, it, it, it had amazed me that nobody had ever written, no historian or biographer had ever written a full-scale study, account, narrative of FDR as commander-in-chief in the most violent war in human history. How was that possible? It was egregious. And why did it have to be this quiet, modest historian from England? <laughs> well, I was lucky enough in my earlier years to have actually gotten to know and stay with Winston Churchill at Chartwell in Kent when I was a student. And I had got to know the commander-in-chief of the American, British, and Canadian armies at D-Day, Field Marshal Montgomery. So I f didn't feel perhaps as intimidated <laughs> as I should have been when I began. And I certainly, when I managed to get a publisher uh, to take it on, I, I thought I was only going to write one volume. Well, this was the first volume which ended uh, when the American troops land in North Africa, Operation Torch, because FDR has overruled his commanders in chief, he does not want to uh, mount a cross-channel invasion which will be destroyed by the Wehrmacht uh, using troops who've never seen action before. He's overridden his chiefs of staff, Marshal and King, and he has insisted that American troops start fighting somewhere as far as pos away as possible from German reinforcement where they can learn the business of modern war. It's a pretty incredible thing that a president of the United States would have the gumption to overrule his foremost military advisors. No, we'll wait. And then volume, t so I remember the day when I handed in the manuscript and my editor sent me a note saying, Nigel, I've got the manuscript. It's in manuscript 800 pages. And we're still in 1942. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that I had to write a second volume. And admittedly, I promised that that would be enough to cover the whole war. Um, and that begins also with a voyage. Uh, it begins with a voyage in an airplane, a flying boat. It's FDR leaving to fly to Casablanca, to North Africa, to uh, meet with his commanders, his combat commanders in, uh, in Morocco, Eisenhower, Mark Clark, George Patton, and once again to overrule his 
chiefs of staff, his military advisors, because he still doesn't think the United States, which launched a miraculously successful invasion of North Africa in Morocco and, and in Algeria, but these were against Vichy French defenders. So American troops had still not learned how to wage war against a really tough enemy like the Wehrmacht. So he not only overruled his commanders, but he set once again a sort of moral basis for what the war was to be about. I liked Andy's point of view about what a commander in chief in war or president in war, uh, what are the things he really has to do. And every so often he has to take time out, so to speak, to think about the, the larger perspective and not just be swept along by events, which, as you say, can very quickly sw sweep you along. So he sets down the principle of unconditional surrender, no negotiation with the Nazis. It's a message that he's going to stand by. Not everyone was entirely pleased with it, especially politicians who like to negotiate, but he wanted everybody under American command to know that was the policy of the United States, no negotiation with these bastards. Sorry to use that word. So, the, uh, just as he'd hoped, under General Eisenhower, American forces are wonderfully successful in North Africa, an entire German army surrenders to General Eisenhower in May of 1943. By August of 1943, American troops and British and Canadians have uh, landed and a tr tremendous kind of mini D-Day, well not mini, but a rehearsal for D-Day in Sicily. And they've also landed on the shores of southern Italy at Salerno. And that was where volume two, to the sadness of my editor, <laughs> who realized this was still not the end of the war. So it required one more book. And I promised him, on my honor, that would be it. So War and Peace, the new book, which came out yesterday, um, covers the period from uh, November 1943 through to the death of uh, FDR in April of 1945. And it starts once again with a voyage uh, when the president on board the USS Iowa sets off for North Africa and for Cairo and Tehran. And he's, he's going to meet Stalin for the first time to try and combine their efforts, their strategies. But most of all, he's going because he is, he's been informed by his advisors and intelligence that Winston Churchill is once again on the warpath to stop D-Day. And it is amazing to me that so many Americans, I can understand why Britons are fearful of sort of offending the memory of Winston Churchill, um, but it amazes me that this is such an unknown moment in American history. In some ways, I think it is the most critical moment from a military perspective in terms of battles and campaigns in the whole war against Nazi Germany. Because Winston Churchill has said he is not going to abide by the agreements that he'd made in Nigel's volume two <laughs> at Quebec. He's agreed that D-Day to be called Overlord, will be mounted on the 1st of May, 1944. And the reason for that is you can't cross the English Channel in winter <laughs> and hope to survive for very long in terms of reinforcement. 
so he wants to land as early as possible in the spring of 1944. And he needs to do it as early as possible because he needs enough campaigning weather in northern France to be able to defeat the Wehrmacht in battle. He feels the troops, American, British, and Canadian troops, are ready, and most of all, the commanders are ready. The combat commanders who've learned how to mesh air, naval, and, and army forces. So here he is on the USS Iowa with his chiefs of staff, General Marshall. Uh, I'm looking at a much smaller version down here. Uh, Admiral Leahy and Admiral King. And he's having to... This is when a president really earns his <laughs> keep. He's having to work out a, a way of overcoming this threatened Churchill showdown. Churchill has even sent a message to Stalin without telling the president, a secret message to Stalin to say, it's off, we ain't going to do it. It's going to have to be delayed. We, we have too many troubles in, in southern Italy and so forth. He even falsifies an American report, which General Eisenhower had sent home, and asks his uh, minister of foreign minister to give it to Stalin, who is amazed. But you know, there's somebody else who's amazed by this Churchill reluctance. And that is St Adolf Hitler. I came across this wonderful uh, quotation from one of Hitler's um, one of his uh, conferences with his uh, with his senior generals. And he says to his senior generals, when and if the Allies land on the shores of northern France, cross-channel invasion, second front. That will be the deciding battle of World War II. This is in late 1943. And he says, so we have on the one hand, the president with his chiefs of staff who knows that he's going to have a rough time with Winston Churchill, who is determined to stop D-Day. And he's going to present uh, what he, Churchill calls an indictment of American strategy in Cairo. And we, on the other side of the English Channel, Hitler addresses his uh, generals and says that I can't believe this. Here it is. The landings that the Allies are proposing to counter, carry out, he doesn't know quite well where it will be, whether it's the Pas de Calais or the Cotentin Peninsula. But Hitler tells his generals it won't be very difficult. The Wehrmacht will rub them out. And then he adds, this is the quotation, it won't be very difficult. After all, he, Hitler, quote, these are from the minutes of the conference, he doesn't, he, Hitler, doesn't have the feeling that the British have, shall we say, their whole heart in the attack. Well, if you're going to carry out the greatest seaborne invasion in history, you damn well ought to have your heart in the attack, and you need a commander-in-chief, because Winston Churchill was effectively the commander-in-chief of all the British Empire and forces, including Canadians, Australians, uh, South Africans, New Zealanders, etc. 
as prime, not only as prime minister, but because he had made himself uh, minister of defense. And so one half of the invasion in terms of uh, Churchill's oppo opposition to the project was threatening to pull out. And that is what faces FDR when he arrives in Cairo. And before he arrives, he makes sure that he spends several days with his American commander-in-chief, he's also the Allied commander-in-chief, in the Mediterranean, young Dwight David Eisenhower. Again, what, this is one of the sort of luckiest things <laughs> in military history. He spends several days with Ike, and he, here he is listening to Ike, here he is talking, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I think the bottom right-hand side, I have a little sort of dinner with some senior uh, officers. The President of the United States, wearing his mantle of command, is listening to what actual fighting commanders, even young ones, will tell him. He's, he's feeling out whether these are the guys who really will, who believe in a cross-channel invasion, a second front. And so when he arrives in Cairo, he greets Churchill and pretends to be, as he had been, uh, best of friends, while knowing that Churchill has gone behind his back, uh, communicated directly with Stalin to say the British are probably not going to go ahead with it and so forth. So how does he get Winston Churchill? They're both going to go to Tehran to meet Stalin. How does he get Winston Churchill to back down? That is a story which has hardly ever been told, even by military historians, and certainly hasn't been valued or evaluated in the way that I, as a military historian and biographer, feel it really should be, if we're going to do justice to the course of World War II. Because this is the moment. This is the great moment. After all, Hitler's quite clear. I think I quoted him saying, D-Day will decide the war. But if the British aren't actually going to co-mount the invasion from their shores, it can't be done. And so trying to marry my little expertise as a military historian but also as a biographer, I've tried to put the reader in the book, on the boat, at Eisenhower's headquarters, using people's diaries to understand how this amazing president, with all his skills of mixing charm, but also a sort of steely resolution uh, and a reading of other people's personalities, how he gets Winston Churchill to back down. That's a wonderfully illustrated, <laughs> I think, photograph that sort of sums up what was going on. Here's this six foot three president and here's Winston Churchill, five foot six, but a bulldog. <laughs> but a bulldog who's had, in a sense, his finest hour, which undoubtedly 1940 was. I mean, you know, nobody can ever uh, diminish what Winston Churchill did in 1940. But after Pearl Harbor, he has been uh, a, a great partner to the United States in a partnership which he wanted so badly, but he's also been a consistent trial to the United States, especially to the President of the United States, as I've tried to explain in the books. Not because I'm hostile to Winston Churchill. I'm originally British. 
I'm the last person outside the Churchill family who stayed with Winston Churchill. I admired Winston Churchill. But we've got to tell the truth. And 75 years after my father landed on those beaches, I am so proud that the British did go ahead with the invasion. And the man who forced them to, who overcame Winston Churchill's reluctance, was the man on the left, the President of the United States, as Commander-in-Chief. And I think it really was about time, even though I am originally English, although I'm a naturalized American, <laughs> it's about time somebody set this out in ink, which I've tried to do. Once he's got Churchill to back down, and I explain in the book how he does it, they set off for Tehran. There he is arriving. Can you see the mountains in the background? And here is the Russian embassy where he stayed and where each day they would have these meetings with Stalin to discuss the strategy. And that's when the D-Day operation was cast in, do you cast it in stone? No. In, in concrete? Yeah. I'm st struggling for a metaphor that's appropriate. <laughs> but anyway, this was to me the triumph of FDR's whole life as a, as a commander-in-chief in wartime. That he had got this great ally, an ally that was so reluctant to carry out the invasion to back down and to agree to do it. And not only to agree to do it, but getting Stalin, the third member of the party, to agree to mount a huge Russian offensive to coincide simultaneously, to coincide with D-Day, Operation Bagration. on the Eastern Front, so that Hitler's forces facing the Allies, the American and Canadian and British troops, w wouldn't have to face, those troops, American troops wouldn't have to face German Wehrmacht divisions being pulled back from the Eastern Front, because the Russians would be attacking at the same time, and as in North Africa, the Wehrmacht would be sort of sandwiched between them. So FDR, as you can see there, is looking pretty pleased, delighted. <laughs> Churchill, <laughs> a little less. But, you know, bless him, he has, it's, it's sort of two against three, but he, he has uh, uh, accepted it uh, with... Um, I was going to say, with good, good grace, it wasn't entirely. There is, a, there is a, a wonderful quote from his doctor's diary that when he came back to um, the British legation, the doctor saw that he was upset and said, well, Prime Minister, um, is everything all right? And Churchill said, mm. yeah. I think the doctor said, uh, it asked if anything had gone wrong. And Churchill said, a bloody lot has gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope I'm not trivializing what is really a, a pretty serious moment in history, but um, and so often uh, covered up and ignored, uh, and which, as I keep saying, deserves to be remembered on the 75th anniversary of D-Day especially. So here he is, the president, because on top of forcing Churchill to back down, on top of getting Stalin to, uh, uh, to mount a, 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 an offensive on the Russian front to coincide with D-Day, on top of getting Stalin to agree 
that the Russians will put an army of perhaps a million men into the war with Japan once Germany is defeated, on top of that achievement, what does he do? He flies back from Tehran to Cairo and to everybody's surprise, everybody who thinks that General Marshall, the chief of staff of the United States Army, is going to be appointed as the supreme commander of the D-Day invasion. In fact, the president has pretty much promised him he, he's going to be. What does he do? He decides, no, he will keep Marshall in Washington and he will use this young American commander-in-chief who's proved his mettle as a coalition commander. Uh, and he takes, uh, that's why those key days he spent with Eisenhower on the way out to, uh, to uh, Cairo were so important. I found a, it was a sort of unpublished uh, memoir that uh, General Eisenhower had written, I think, and he, while I was researching, I found it, and it, Eisenhower was reminiscing, and he was saying, um, you know, um, General Marshall complained that we, we were just being moved around like chess pieces <laughs> because the president at that point, didn't want to commit himself as to who would be the supreme commander. But once he got D-Day agreed and cast in whatever, whether it's stone or concrete, he was as happy as a sandboy and wanted not only to send a signal to Eisenhower, which he did, you will be commanding the invasion, but to go in person and tell Eisenhower and talk to Eisenhower about the sort of problems he would be facing. So. He flies to Tunis from Cairo, and together, the two men, on board the president's plane, I'm sure you know the nickname, the sacred cow, <laughs> the two men fly to Sicily. In fact, the president wanted to go to Italy, but um, Eisenhower said, well, I think that's getting a bit close to them. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, he awards a medal, distinguished service to to uh, General Clark, and he. Can you see General Patton at the back of the jeep on the top one? I don't know how this this anyway. You can see. And he famously says to General Patton at the back there. I think there's another picture of that. Uh, Oops, he says to General Patton, do you see Patton at the back of the jeep? There with the three stars. He says to General Patton, Patton is under a terrible dark cloud because he's, um, he's got into terrible trouble for uh, slapping GIs in a um, uh, field hospital uh, as shirkers, basically. And uh, he's been more or less removed from command. And he says, and so Patton is beside himself with anxiety that he's never going to be allowed to go into combat again. And he says to, calls Patton over and says, General, you will command an army in D-Day, or Overlord as it was called, in the invasion. So, with that, the president returns on board the Iowa, full of beans. Here he is being fated in Washington, uh, administration officials, congressmen at the White House. And here he is with his family at Hyde Park celebrating Christmas. And from Hyde Park, surrounded by his family, broadcasting to the people of the world that the commander-in-chief of the invasion, the great invasion, will be General Dwight Eisenhower. He looks fine, he looks good, he is good. He gets flu. And then we come to the sadder part of the story. Um, I didn't bring my watch, but how, how are we doing on time? 
five to seven. How long, Andy, should I? Ten minutes? Tell me if this is getting boring or what? No. Um, uh, <laughs> no, you may have engagements. Or, or, ten minutes. Because uh, the, the first part of this, the book is, is the triumph of D-Day, of getting that invasion set, set in stone. All right. Is that okay? okay? But then he falls ill. And so the second part of the book is really a very sad one. Because here is this man who's been so much in command of the Allies, basically. He is the Allied Commander-in-Chief. And from this moment onwards, he just gets sicker and sicker. And by March, when his daughter comes from the West Coast and sees him, and sees he can hardly breathe, she insists that Admiral McIntyre, the White House doctor, bring in some specialists, some consultants. And it's at that point that the president is basically given a sentence of death for fatal heart disease. So this is in the still, this is before D-Day. This is going to be the greatest battle of the war, it's certainly in Europe. Hitler knows that. Even, even Churchill knows that by now, although Churchill did actually try. He was an obstinate man, and he tried one more attempt at his own D-Day, unfortunately, in Italy, a, a battle called Anzio in January, just after the president came back. But the president was too ill, basically, to stop him. And in a period of three months, 43 thousand American and British casualties were, uh, were the result, a real tragedy. But D-Day, fortunately, is a fantastic success. Here's the, uh, the famous D-Day prayer. Here is a photograph that purports to be of June um, 1944, but I don't believe it. Uh, there are the troops going ashore on the 6th of June. Here are the, this huge logistic backup to it all for this great battle that's going to take place that summer, the reason for why it was so important to do it as early as possible. But the president is dying. And everybody around him feels that he has, he, he, this cannot be made public. This would be just what Hitler wants. This would be an example of, uh, this would be just perfect for the Germans. And so this uh, long period of deceit is considered necessary they bring in this young heart consultant, uh, Dr. Brun. He saves the president's life, basically, in late March of 1944, before D-Day. And the president is more or less kept alive. He's only able to work one or two hours a day. Not just the president, but the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the United States, one or two hours a day. And he knows, he's, he's been told, he knows what the verdict is. He knows he can't survive. And yet, he also knows that he has to see if he can keep going, because the war isn't over. I mean, there were people who hoped that immediately after D-Day, the Germans would throw in the cards, but those who knew Germans, especially the Wehrmacht, knew otherwise. 
So he goes on yet another voyage. This is one going out to Pearl Harbor because he's been told that his command is out in Hawaii, or in the Pacific rather. He has two commanders in chief there, Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur, simply won't get together and discuss how best to continue the war in the Pacific and how to invade Japan, or whether to invade Japan. So here he is, covering up his sickness, but forcing MacArthur to fly all the way from Australia because the president has commanded <laughs> that he should come to Pearl Harbor and sit down with his opposite number from the Navy, Admiral Nimitz. Admiral Lee, he's on the, the president's chief of staff is on the right-hand side there. And in, at Pearl Harbor, he gets uh, the two commanders, MacArthur on the left, standing uh, Nimitz to tell him how they think the uh, war in the Pacific should be continued. And from that moment on, Nimitz and MacArthur have a really very good relationship, which really does impact the war in the Pacific. But the president is almost dead. Here he is returning from Pearl Harbor He's on a destroyer, the USS Cummings, which he transferred onto. And somebody who obviously didn't realize how sick he was uh, arranged for him to give a, I think it was a 30 minute speech, standing on those metal stilts. And of course he had a heart attack in the middle of it. So the story I have to tell in the book is a very sad one of, I suppose you could call it a necessary deceit. But given the stature of this man and his commanding role as basically the head of the Allies, it was considered by everybody around him that he simply would have to start stand for a fourth term, which is what he did. Of course, how he came to choose Harry Truman is... <laughs> A story in itself, but he did. And they made a great combination. If only the president had taken Truman really into his trust and um, used him as a deputy rather than the traditional vice president like Wallace. Anyway, they, they were triumphant at the polls. Uh, in November, and the inauguration took place in uh, January of 45. And by then, the president certainly can't appear at, uh, at uh, the Capitol, so the uh, inauguration takes place on the back balcony at the White House. And even then, the president goes on yet another journey. This is just a map that's in the book of his route on the USS Quincy. I don't know how clear this is, but can you see? It just gives you an idea of where he's got to go, this dying president, to be able to get to Yalta. And, and as Andy said, to discuss in a formal conference with his main allies the end game. The military end game, that was the zones of occupation particularly. The war against Japan, making sure that Stalin would contribute major Russian forces to the defeat of Japan. And also uh, Poland, a pretty insoluble problem at that point because Russian troops were already in Poland. And this dying president, in the one or two hours a day that he is... You see, this isn't just a physical illness. This isn't just heart disease. This is affecting his whole um, circulation and his mind. And so he struggles. Here he is on the way out to uh, 
to uh, to uh, Yalta. This is at Malta, uh, sitting with General Marshall. But more and more of the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions are made either by Admiral Leahy, his, his chief of staff, or by General Marshall. Here he is landing at Yalta. You can see what a difference between that picture and his triumph after Tehran. Even more so here, sitting with Churchill. They do conclude the conference. Today it's still fought over in terms of whether it was right, wrong, unjust, just, uh, realistic, inevitable, whatever. But he did his best and hoped at least to set a, a capstone on his great vision of a united nations and a security council that would safeguard post-war peace, as well as getting the Russians to, uh, to help in the war against Japan. And he felt that was just about as much as he could do. And then he boards the uh, USS Quincy when he's flown back to the Mediterranean. And he's almost, he's almost dead on the boat. Uh, in fact, his military, um, his military assistant, General um, Help me, Andy. Oh. His, his military uh, um, assistant, he was, um, he had a naval assistant and a military assistant, um, it'll come back to me, senior moment, um, died on the way back of heart disease. Um, so it's a very different President Roosevelt who returns to Washington. Here he is giving his report on Yalta, but he can't even stand at this point. He has to apologize, and uh, he sits in a wheelchair, and most people who were present, when you read their diaries and so forth, say, well, he was virtually incomprehensible. There is one tiny s silver lining beyond the creation of the United Nations, which I think we all agree isn't the greatest success, but it was a hell of a lot better than the League of Nations after World War I. Here he is working on uh, his speech for the United Nations that he was going to inaugurate in San Francisco later that month, April of 1945. But the little silver lining is Lucy Rutherford. Because incredibly, in the very week that the president is diagnosed with fatal heart disease, that very week, Lucy Rutherford, who had been the great love of his life during at the time of World War I, had married somebody else and went, went he Rutherford, and he died that same week. And so Lucy becomes, who was a very proper lady once she married, uh, she becomes his sort of romantic uh, amanuensis. I mean, we're not talking sex at this point, but we're talking about somebody who gives this dying president, who doesn't really want to go on. Well, it's not, not really. He doesn't want to go on. She gives him uh, a kind of reason to live. And it is a very uh, moving end to his life because... Uh, he invites Lucy, he's, he's been seeing Lucy again and again in Washington, at Hyde Park, at Shangri-La, uh, 
in South Carolina, but he invites her for a second time to Warm Springs. And she is sitting beside him, closer than I am to Andy, when he suddenly, he's working at his desk and being painted by Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Schumatov. And he complains of a headache. I might, if there's one minute, I might read you the last couple of lines of the book. Just, um, it's much easier to do with books. You know, you can find a page. But, you know, in terms of Bill Hassett had dried the fifty odd papers the president had signed in ink. Once gathered, like laundry, the private secretary had put them neatly into a folder on the card table which the president used as his desk. Lucy and Daisy, that's Daisy Suckley, his neighbor and friend, were sitting on the sofa watching Madame Shumatov at work on the life-size watercolor. She was painting as fast as she could, filling in the sitter's eyes, but became aware suddenly that, quite, quote, his gaze had a faraway look and was completely solemn. He'd just told her about the stamp he'd asked for to celebrate the upcoming conference. Wait till you see the San Francisco stamps with the United, Station, United Nations. But seemed then to have moved somewhere else in his mind, staring at Lucy next to him. It was about 1.15 p.m. Daisy Suckley, crotching on the sofa, recalled the president looking for something, his head forward, his hands fumbling. That's quote. Immediately she rose, quote, I went forward, this is from her diary, and looked into his face. Have you dropped your cigarette? She asked, alarmed. He looked at me with his forehead furrowed in pain and tried to smile. He put his left hand up to the back of his head and said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. These would be the president's last words, Daisy quite certain of them afterwards. Quote, he said it distinctly, but so low that I don't think anyone else heard it. My head was not a foot from his. I told him to put his head back on his chair. The president is sick. Call the doctor, Madame Shumatov meanwhile yelled. They lifted him onto his bed. His doctor was summoned. He was down at the uh, rehabilitation swimming pools of Warm Spring, Springs. And the, but the doctor realized this was the end, although it could be what he called a long siege. In the, in the event, the siege did not last long. Lucy Rutherford, recognizing immediately the end was approaching, told Elizabeth Shumatov to pack her easel and bags and summon Nicholas Robbins, who took that photo. In the white Cadillac, they set off from the estate before the press could arrive. They would only hear whether or not the president had actually passed away when they stopped to telephone the little White House on their journey home. The flag at Macon, that's how Louisiana's people pronounce it, like bacon, Macon. The flag at Macon was already at half-mast. The operator, before putting the call through, asked if they knew what had already become national, in fact, global news, at 3.35 p.m. local time, April the 12th, 1945. The commander-in-chief was dead. Thank you very much. I'd be happy, a few questions, madam. Thank you so much. It sounds from everything you've said about FDR that he was a lion. And I was wondering, as you were talking, if the idea for D-Day was his own original idea, and what role, if any, did his circle of advisors play in advising him, and 
did he think up all the strategies himself over the course of the two or three years you've been describing about working with Churchill and Stalin? Um, very interesting question. Um, when we talk about great strategists, um, that is a, um, a very large area uh, because uh, people have different um, notions of what strategy, grand strategy, and tactical strategy are. And uh, Hitler, for instance, was the sort of strategist who, let's say, wishes to invade a country, assembles his uh, military advisors, listens to their presentations on how they would go about it, and then meddles continuously <laughs> while they try to carry it out. Uh, Winston Churchill um, also gets, uh, I don't know what to call them, bees in his bonnet, <laughs> about uh, specific uh, notions of attack. The Dardanelles in World War I, say, or uh, defending Crete in 1941, or um, uh, attacking in the desert at Alamein before General Montgomery was ready or whatever. He's in a very impetuous kind of uh, strategist, Churchill. But he's been in the military himself since he was a kid. He's been to British uh, college, you know, military college. He fancies himself as a general. So that picture I showed you of him in his famous dressing gown is quintessential Winston Churchill looking really pleased with himself because he's dreamed up this idea, he's heard about it, of an attack at Anzio, which he thinks will liberate Rome. And the names of these places occupy a huge, he's a, he's a terrific politician and he does understand the sort of moral value that people place by, by uh, by names. Think of all the phrases we use. I don't know, the Grand Alliance. and <laughs> They're all coined by Winston Churchill. He, he sees the, the, uh, the liberation of Rome as a wonderful victory, but a victory that will take place under British aegis, because once Eisenhower goes to England to command to be supreme commander of the invasion, cross-channel invasion, the Mediterranean and Italy and the Balkans will be a British controlled area. There will be a British supreme commander there. So that's the kind of strategist, if you like, that Winston Churchill is. The president is, I don't know, I'm not enough of a presidential historian to know across the centuries how different he was from other presidents. Andy and I can talk about this later. Um, but he is, to my mind, I don't think I can say unique, but he is very special in that he is a wonderful listener. So he has a a sort of general vision of what he'd like to achieve. And he's quite certain from the time before Pearl Harbor that if Germany is defeated, Japan won't last very long if, if Japan becomes involved in the war. So he's, uh, the question then is, how do you defeat Germany? Well, all his military advisors said, well, a cross-channel invasion especially using modern tanks and so forth, uh, particularly after the fall of France and so forth, where the Germans have been so brilliant. A cross-channel invasion is the thing to do. So the president says, yes, okay, and it, that project is built into something called the Victory Plan, just before Pearl Harbor, 1941. So that's the kind of visionary he is, and then, within the compass of that larger design, if you like, how to defeat the enemy, where to put, as Andy was saying, where to put your, your main logistics. And within that, he has to find the people who, as commander-in-chief, 
who will uh, carry it out. Again, Churchill wasn't very good about it. I mean, when I knew Montgomery, he said, the last person who wanted me as commander of the 8th Army at Alamein was the prime minister <laughs> who didn't like me. <laughs> well, there were a lot of people who didn't like Monty. <laughs> so that um, is a rather long-winded way of explaining the kind of strategist he is. He's, he's, he's a visionary. He's, he has an overall plan for what he wants. He takes advice from his military advisors as the best way to probably the best way to achieve it. He overrules them if he feels this cannot be done without incredible casualties, which is what would have happened in 1942 or 43 if D-Day had taken place. And then when the time comes and American forces have shown their mettle, in Sicily particularly, then he says, go. And then he becomes this man of steel. And yet, within the steel just nice enough to Winston, his good friend, to make sure that he doesn't lose his ally. Now that, to me, is genius. And I would say, if Winston Churchill's finest hour was 19, the summer of 1940, which undoubtedly it was, FDR's finest hour was that direction of World War II from Pearl Harbor to his death. And I simply don't think we value it highly enough. Several people. Who's got a microphone? Sir. What, who? Hi, thank you. Um, when you mentioned about um, Ro um, Roosevelt at, creating, having this conflict with Churchill about D-Day, I've also read in many writings, and they that and they, they make an excuse. They don't make. They make an excuse for it. Is that Roosevelt, when he met with Stalin and Churchill, almost they used the word "ganged up." I don't know if that's yeah. a proper word, but "ganged up" on Roosevelt and Stalin ganged up on Churchill in terms of ideas. Is that does that have to? Inter, is that intertwined with the D-Day? And well, it is entwined with D-Day because it is. It's 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 a. Um, it's an assertion that's been made by a number of commentators after Tehran who felt sorry for Churchill, because Churchill did, there's no doubt, Churchill bore a, a, a grudge. I mean, after all, the Mediterranean uh, roads, <laughs> the Dardanelles, uh, the Black Sea, the Balkans, you know, these were... These were, this was Churchill's vision that went back to World War I. It had failed in World War I. He was so determined that he should have a chance at least to do it in World War II. And he couldn't do it with that, with, just with British troops. He tried, just as this book opens. He, he uh, invades with British troops the Dodecanese, Dodecanese Islands. And every single one was trounced by the Wehrmacht. He could only do these things with American help. And the president wasn't going to give him that in an area which neither he nor Hitler felt would defeat the Nazis. And so at Tehran, Churchill is uh, almost distraught and emotional. He's upset. He gives in, but he's emotionally upset by it. And since then, Historians, particularly British historians, who uh, admire Winston Churchill, have picked on little small things from the conference and from the minutes uh, as a way of saying, well, he was badly treated. Well, I won't say what I would like to say about that because it is rubbish. It's, it's, it's hornswoggle. Uh, it, if in the course of a four, five days they were together, they, he and Stalin mocked him. Hey, Stalin toasted Churchill. This is a communist dictator who was ha had a pact with the Nazis after all in 1939. Stalin uh, raised a toast to Winston Churchill for his 
courage and bravery in 1940. So, you know, if at any point they rib each other or whatever, there is far more evidence of the admiration between these leaders. And I think those sort of stories have been used time and again to sweep under the ca carpet the absolutely critical decision about D-Day that had to be made in November and the first days of December 1943. The man who saved D-Day. Sorry to emphasize this, but I do feel strongly that the time has come to be quite definitive about this. Uh, uh, um, Andrew Roberts, whom you know probably a uh, very good biographer and good historian, wrote a big, major, bi new biography of Churchill a few months ago in which he claimed that Churchill never wanted to delay D-Day. I mean, I should sue him on your behalf. <laughs> No, I'm making light of this in a way, but, but it is serious in terms of history. Do we have time for one more question? Sir. Yes. Uh, one of the, the key ways in which you talk about this is that you say that the Germans were not planning One of the strategic elements that Roosevelt was planning on was the UN. He was thinking about it from 1937 on. Of course, he'd been thinking about the League of Nations and what had happened there. So that also was something that was quite extraordinary. He had this vision from the beginning of the war, how he wanted to end, end, end the war, and what, and what kind of security uh, organization would be the place for all the winning powers could all come together to, to block out a possibility of any war in the future. You put it very well, sir. <laughs> I think that's probably after my one more. We need to, before they, before I'll they remove the wine and <laughs> the books, let's all go upstairs and meet and post. Nigel Hamilton.